was I going to connect with 11 minutes of divorce rage? I had literally just gotten my first girlfriend. What's up, assault-flavored monsters? That's a real drink and also my new nickname for band dudes who got in trouble for statutory business at the Warp Tour. Welcome to the 2022 edition of Guarcenio's High School CD Booklet Review. It's the same concept as last year, but now I have a mustache. I grew it for the King Diamond video, and guess what? I think it looks great, so it's sticking around for a while. Today, we're talking about the pride of the Denver scene kid scene. Fear before the March of Flames, art damage. Today's gonna be a weird episode because I gotta talk about 2005 Denver. Rock Island, who remembers? These guys were my introduction to that noisy, converge, botch, pain in the ass style hardcore. I bought this at a used CD store called Second Spin, and the big thing that I remember about that shop is it was the only CD shop that had like a proper CD listening station. Every now and then you'd find a shop that had like a disc man lying around that you could use, but Second Spin kind of went all out with it. They had like a whole listening zone. There were like six boom boxes next to these blue 60s James Bond villain style chairs. And I distinctly remember finding a used copy of this album and listening to the whole thing in one of those chairs. I really liked it. And then I found out that they were from Colorado and I was like, oh, hell yeah. They were the first Colorado band that was adjacent to music I was into that was signed to a label I had heard of. And I think it's the one time in my life that I understood that like fierce, local sports team loyalty. Like I was ready to be a late 90s Knicks fan for these guys. However, I think I only got to see them once or twice because the album after this kind of got them ostracized from the scene. That album got good reviews and I personally liked it, but it's a hardcore tale as old as time. An early odds hardcore band puts out an album that isn't hardcore, and so the scene abandons them. Caven was so influential to the hardcore scene, they even invented the way you get kicked out of it. Anyway, I think this album was the right first way for me to hear this sound. Their production, I think, is honestly awesome. It's tight and crisp, but still chaotic. I also think the Blood Brothers and indie influence gave this band a sassy attitude and a little stinker energy that I could empathize with as a fellow little stinker. Like, dude, I was 15 years old and coming from mainstream metal, which is precise, clean, and if we're being honest, dumb as shit. There's no way I could have gone from that straight to Jane Doe and got it. How the fuck was I gonna connect with 11 minutes of divorce rage? I had literally just gotten my first girlfriend. Also, these guys in the Blood Brothers were the only sassy, noisy, hardcore bands that I liked. There were many others, but I think those two were the only ones that didn't become assault-flavored monsters. And since we're speaking about the Denver scene, I gotta give a quick shout out to Ethan McCarthy of Primitive Man. Around this time, he had a great grindcore band that I think was called Clinging to the Trees of the Forest Fire. And dude, he is solely responsible for Denver becoming the metal mecca that it is today. When I was growing up there, there was no metal at all. It's probably why I became a scene kid. But Ethan was braver than me for many reasons, and he forced the genre to exist there. The dude was putting on shows inside of his actual living rooms, and he made sure that real extreme bands decided to tour through the state. So if you've ever been to Black Sky or True or whatever, go buy a Primitive Man shirt as a thank you. Also, big shout out to Maris the Great. If you don't know who he is, Google him. He was our local Alvira. He rocks. Anyway, let's talk about this album art. This looks like the art they sell in Target, but only during August when there's a dorm room section. Do they still do that? If I go to Target, I make a beeline straight to the toy section to see which stupid character from my childhood finally has an action figure. Wow, John Hammond from Jurassic Park, my second favorite 90 year old Attenborough brother. This looks like the jazz funeral scene from Live and Let Die. I don't know, man. It's the 31st episode. It's becoming hard to write jokes about shitty graphic design. Roger Moore wasn't my favorite Bond, but at least he tried. This looks like a Pantone color swatch for their new shade of green, Antifreeze Piss! This looks like a Soviet propaganda post discouraging you from a career in the arts, which, considering what I do for a living, I kind of wish I listened to Comrade March of Flames. This looks like the poster for Denny Villeneuve's Reservoir Dogs remake. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy, or are you going to punch Harrison Ford? This is what ska bands are going to look like in Blade Runner 2049. So yeah, to sum up, I had a great time listening to this record, and I hope these dudes aren't creeps. That does it for this week's episode. If you want to let me know what you thought of the album, I don't care, but leave a comment anyway. Next week, we're doing Atreyu's Suicide Notes and Butterfly Kisses.